what do you all think the word commons means? What does it mean to you? Forget about the urban. Urban is a thing that we will bring in. What does commons mean? So the commons is something which is strongly associated with tradition and traditional practices and it's a material resource which could be land based therefore there are going to be trees on it, there are going to be water on it, there are going to be all kinds of things but it is something which is strongly associated with the idea of tradition and it's strongly associated with community practices so what people do with it. What if there's a joint family of 40 children, grandchildren, everybody and the Hindu joint family as a household owns 500 acres of land. What if we say that it's a cooperative? There are 40 members, each of them owns one acre and they have formed a cooperative. Is that common? Because the cooperative like the joint household can act as a single entity and as a legal person. Right? It's not through birth but we will say that we are not going to take in more members or we will set rules to say that only people who meet these qualifications can become members. Will that still be the commons? No. So then what is commons? Something that can exclude cannot be the commons. Yeah? It has to be completely open to anyone and everything. What, when, because we need to have a definition that is workable in practice. So that condition that it has to be open to everyone and anyone without any conditions will not work, right? So then what is it? What is the commons? Have any of you heard the expression tragedy of the commons? What do you think it means? What could be the tragedy of the commons? Right. So the commons is something that is associated with or is used by or is available to the commoners. In the commons, if people over exploit, then the resource will get destroyed. Right? But that simply means that there are, there are no rules. Which is precisely the point that your neighbor was making a while ago, that there is a community and the community makes the rules and if there are rules being made, then nobody can over exploit. So the community will take care of the rule making and ensuring that the commons are not destroyed. Because having the commons functional is useful for you, it's useful for me. Therefore, we have to make sure that it works. Therefore, between you and me, we are going to make the rules that you are not going to over exploit. Right? That is one. The second thing is there is a fallacy in what you have said, which is that Akipas peace guy hai, mere paas do bhans hai. So I am going to use less. You are going to use more. That in itself does not necessarily destroy the resource. That is not over exploitation. Akipas peace guy hai, to peace guy ke liye khana chahiye. Mere paas do hi hai, to do guy ke liye khana chahiye. That is not over exploitation. Over exploitation is when I say ki mujhe jitna zarurat hai, usme se mai aur zyada le lunga because I don't care what happens to the others. Right? I can graze my cows for two hours and that's adequate and also sustainable. But I say, no, just because I can afford to do this, I am going to make my cows graze for 10 hours. And I don't care what happens to the common resource. That's over exploitation. Right? If we want to manage the resource carefully, then we are going to say that all of us have to exercise some kind of restraint to make sure that it works. And that's precisely the point, that the community makes the rules and if it makes the rules, then it works. Right? So we still have community, community based practices and rules, a material resource that is somehow based on land. We do have this notion that it has to have something of a collective.
although we don't know what its contours could be, right, we still have this notion that it probably has something to do with the elite, the king, the aristocrats, people with resources, power and so on on one side and those without resources, those without power on the other side, whether they were put in jail and turned into slaves or not is a different matter, but there is some kind of a notion of power involved in this. What we are struggling with really is the notion of property. Can there be property in the commons? If we have private property, right, because if we have to have exclusion, ki itne hi log aa sakte hain iske andar, yahi ke log aa sakte hain. If we are saying that we can make rules about who can come in and who cannot come in, then we are talking about some kind of property. What kind of property is this or is this even a property? Can we make rules about excluding someone without owning it as property? What does it take to make those rules? It takes a community, right? It takes some sense of community that we are together in this somehow and we need this for ourselves. The boundaries of that could be set from inside, they could be set through some kind of conflict with the outside, but they will also have to have some sense of long term sustainability, right? it has to be something that is not going to give up its ghost as we keep exploiting it. If it ends up dead then it's no good for anyone. Right? So let's say that that's broadly the set of things that we need to think about when it comes to commons. Let's look at the idea of rights. What does rights mean to you? I'm not asking for a technical definition of rights. What does rights mean to you? What do you mean when you say mera ye haq banta hai? Ownership. But that's a particular form of right, right? Or if you have, if you own something, then you have the right to set a boundary around it and say that I shall decide who is going to use it in what way. That's a particular type of right. What does right mean in a more general sense? An entitlement. Against what? So as a student when you entered the institution, when you are registered as a student, you are expecting some kind of an implicit or explicit contractual obligation from the institution to provide you certain things. Right? The moment you cease to be a student, you lose that right. right? And a non-student cannot claim the rights of a student. Are there any other ways of thinking about rights? What does human rights mean then? Who is it a contract with? I exist, I am a human being and I am making a claim that I have rights as a human. Who is it a contract with? The state. So when I am born, I am entering into a contract with the state. What happens when the state violates your rights as a human? Because the constitution says that it can take away your rights. If citizenship rights works for all of us, why do we even need to think about human rights? It could be an ideal situation, it could also be the, f the, the energy or force that you can deploy saying that morally I am entitled to this. It's not something that comes from any contract. Right? It's not a claim against any individual. It's not a claim against any state, although to materialize it, to implement it, to enforce it, you need someone as an interlocutor. But at some abstract level, it's a moral claim. Right? So that's one way of thinking about rights. Hmm. What about fundamental rights? What kind of rights are there? The right to life and liberty. Is that a contractual right? Have you entered into any 
कॉन्ट्रैक्ट विथ एनी वन नोइंगली और अनोइंगली सेइंग दैट मैं यहां हूं देयर फोर मैं यहां हूं और इस रूप में हूं देयर फोर आई हैव राइट टू लाइफ एंड लिबर्टी आई एम ऑब्लिगेटेड टू डू वन टू थ्री थिंग्स एज अ स्टूडेंट यूर ऑब्लिगेटेड टू डू अ बंच ऑफ थिंग्स राइट टू बी एबल टू गेट वॉट यू वॉन्ट यू हैव कॉन्ट्रेक्चुअल ऑब्लिगेशन ऑन योर साइड the stateless person is not obligated to do anything to make the claim of certain rights is the right to life and liberty in the constitution a contractual obligation on the part of the state or is it a moral claim why what is your obligation other than living and living freely are my fundamental rights linked to my fundamental duties supposing i i do not deliver on my fundamental duties can the state deny my fundamental rights supposing i say i don't owe any allegiance to the indian constitution then is it up for grabs for anyone or the state to come and shoot me i have said the worst thing possible i don't have any allegiance to the constitution of india and yet the indian state is obligated uphold my right to life and liberty what kind of a right is that it is only in through due process because even there through no arbitrary action can the state take away my right to life and liberty so the fundamental right to life and liberty is a human right in a particular context it is being guaranteed by our state to us that applies even to foreign nationals right even if a foreign national comes into india you can't simply shoot that person there are covenants international treaties there are procedures through which you will have to go and then say that through this jurisprudence through this penal code through this process of establishing something that we have arrived at it. what that basically means is that there are some things that we are holding above everything else and saying that these are rights which do not come with any obligations and that's very very important to keep in mind that there are some rights which are articulated which can only be articulated at the highest level of ethics and morality you have those rights because you are born as human because you belong to the species of humans that's what they are right let's come back to the right to the city what kind of a right is that it's not there in our constitution we haven't entered into any international covenants no treaties what kind of a right is it does the right to the city place any obligations on us मैं सिर्फ पेमेंट के ऊपर चलूंगा आई विल वॉक ओनली ऑन द पेमेंट आई विल नॉट क्रॉस आई विल नॉट डू एनी जे वॉकिंग एम आई रिक्वायर टू डू दैट टू बी एबल टू इन वॉक माई राइट टू द सिटी बाई रिसाइडिंग इन अ सिटी सिंपली बाई वर्चू ऑफ रिसाइडिंग इन अ सिटी आई विल हैव सर्टन राइट्स इज वॉट यूर सेम राइट वॉट डज दैट मेक द राइट टू द सिटी इज दैट of the same order as the fundamental rights because in the fundamental rights you don't have any obligations right in the same way in which you have contractual obligations it's not like the rights of a student the student has rights because he is registered as a student on a particular campus so should i have a ration card or a voter id card identifying me as someone living in a particular city to have right to that particular city's resources no why so you could be from anywhere you don't necessarily have to be a resident of the city you could still have right to the city so there are some resources which everybody needs right. as bare minimum requirements for the business of life and those things should be available to anyone who asks for it in the city Yes. Okay. 
So then we need to make a list of those bare minimum requirements of the business of living. Right? We will have to say water, housing, air, education, yeah. right? transportation. We can make lists of things that we should be entitled to simply by virtue of being in the city. What is that basic living? We need to identify because unless we identify it, we can't ask for it, no? Yeah. If I say that everybody must be having access to clean drinking water at any time under any circumstances in a city, right? Yeah. I'm going along on the street, I don't have money to buy a water bottle, but if I need water, if I'm thirsty, I should get water. It should be the obligation of the city to provide me that water. Right? Bislary water is 20 rupees a bottle. So somebody will have to give me that water or somebody will have to give me that 20 rupees to buy the water. Yes? So we need to make those lists. That's one approach. What if we say that the right to the city is a moral claim? whose concrete forms would change from city to city, context to context, situation to situation, but it is ultimately the highest form of moral claim and therefore belongs in the same class of rights as the right to life and liberty. Because right to life and liberty by itself doesn't mean anything, right? What does it mean? What if I'm living in the, the ugliest possible most depraded conditions, I'm still alive. Right? We're not going to accept that as the availability of right to life and liberty. We are going to say that ki context mein, this is not right at all. This is not the kind of life anybody should be living and therefore I'm invoking right to life and liberty. The beauty of rights like the fundamental rights, rights which come with this kind of a moral charge, is that they are defined in a very high level of abstraction. And the beauty of very highly abstracted notions of rights, entitlements, claims, is that you can frame it, you can look for people against whom you can make those claims, you can make it in any concrete form that you want at any given point of time. And that's politics. That's policy. That's activism, right? It's only because it's available to you in that very abstract form that you can do this. Agar mai kahu ki right to life and liberty, right to the city, right to the city is about having access to adequate housing. Right? And say I'm defining adequate housing as I don't know, 20 feet, 20 square feet per head, and I give you 40 matchbox type houses and say that I have given what the law requires me to give you. It's a horrible thing to get stuck in, right? You should be able to stand on top of those 40 matchboxes and say that this is not adequate housing and this therefore is not matching my notion of right to the city. You can say that only when it is defined in that abstract form. Let's, let's look at how this, this could have happened in history. In 1985, there was a very important court case. <coughs> It's very famously known across the world as the Olga Telles case. Olga Telles case, the concrete result was not that great, but it established a principle. The case was about people living on pavements in Bombay. The municipal corporation tried to kick them out of there. These people went to court saying that you can't throw us out because we have to make a living in order to exercise our right to life and liberty 
and this is the only place where we can actually access work and therefore this is the only place where we can live. So they said their living on the footpath is an exercise of their right to life and liberty. And the Bombay High Court said nonsense. You violated the municipal law. Therefore, you can't invoke right to life and liberty. And the Supreme Court turned it around and said, that makes no sense because right to life and liberty is not a contractual obligation. You can invoke it. You cannot put in legal terms, it's called putting an estopel. So, in the case of right to life and liberty, you can't do that. You can't say that this guy has violated some other law and therefore he's broken the contract and therefore I'm going to stop him from proceeding any further. You can't say that. So, right to the city then is useful only if it is defined at that high level of abstraction as a right that comes with a moral charge without that moral charge it's useless because the state society the business the market can give you any crap and get away with it saying that we have given you right to the city So it's important for all of us to keep in mind that most fundamental thing to remember about right to the city is that it is a moral claim. That moral claim actually may not be enshrined in any concrete laws, which is fine. In fact, it's good sometimes if it is not, because you have the right then to shape it. You have the space to shape it. So that moral charge, high level of abstraction is the most important thing that we need to always keep in mind when we talk about right to the city. It should have in the Indian constitution at least the same status as the right fundamental rights. If not, at the more universal human right status. Its concrete form in each case, its realization in each case is up to us. We can make policies, we can fight for it, we can do politics, we can do what we want. But we need to leave ourselves that room and not reduce it to something very concrete and specific. That right to life is, right to the city is about 2 liters of water every day for drinking. That would be a complete travesty of the idea of right to the city. Which is not to say that we don't need 2 litres of water, but we need a lot more than that. What we need is the right to say that I want 2 litres of water today, tomorrow I should have the right to say that I want 5 litres of water. Right? It's the right to say what you want. That's what the right to the city is about. Let us say that we have given ourselves the highest possible right. We have given ourselves the moral charge and the force and power. What are we going to ask for? Do liter pani? Or are we going to ask for more? That's the whole point, right? That its main gift to you is the moral charge. It gives you the power. A lot of things are not written into the law and we still claim them. That's the reason why right in the beginning I asked you this question. What do you mean when you say ki mera ye haq banta hai? Are you saying that ki mera ye haq banta hai kyunki ye kanun mein likha hua hai? Right? Is it because it is written into the law that you are able to say that ki this is my right? Or is there some other source within yourself, within your politics, which says that I can make this claim on something. You can have a, it written into the law 
that everybody should have adequate water and adequate water because we need a number it should be 3 liters of drinking water per day right then we will say all right you know there are some people who need more some people who need less communities will figure out what to do with it that you can put into the law whether to put that into the law or not is something that you can decide and what you are saying when you say you have the right to the city is that i want the right to say what is going to be put into that right right which is what you are saying ki i want to be able to say that isko aap right banao legally isko mat banao this should not be put into this plan this should not be put into this rule or this should be put into the rule in this particular form with this set of accountabilities i want to be able to say all that right so then we are essentially saying that right to the city gives me the moral power force to say that i want to make these rules that make the city i want to shape the city in this particular form right that's the ambition at which we are talking we're talking about the highest moral force which should give you the highest ambition possible i want to be able to do this right and that is so closely connected to who we are so the city makes who i am and i make the city it's the dual process of transforming the city by transforming myself so the right to the city then is a moral claim to be able to transform myself and the city in which i am living right that's what it ultimately has to be only then it will actually make sense right but for us to be able to do that for us to be able to actualize it you will do it through politics you will do it by bringing people together and therefore the right can only be a collective right it cannot be an individual right and this is the sense in which it differs from the way in which we understand the fundamental rights fundamental rights are rights of individuals the right to the city is essentially a collective right it's a collective claim and it's a claim that comes with a sense of anger against injustice it's a claim that pulls people together into a collective mobilization that is the actual origin of right to the city as it was envisioned in 1968 hundredth year of writing of the das kapital by karl marx in the centenary year the claim was essentially that we are now moving into a world in which we need to make claims at the urban scale because it is the urban the urban scale the urban form in which injustice is likely to happen it's a spatial form of capitalism and the very fundamental understanding is that the urban form in which we are circulating is one that is carrying an imprint of capital accumulation it's a circulation of capital that is manifest and facilitated in the built form of the city therefore the built form of the city matters a lot shahar ke andar kaun si cheez kahan pe hai right because that's what makes things happen let me give you a very 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 simple down to earth example <clears throat> about 
13 years ago, I was doing field work in Hyderabad and I went to meet a group of people who were relocated from a city central location where there was a road that had to be widened to make it possible for more cars to pass through. Traffic was increasing, they needed to widen the road so that traffic flow will be easier. These people were moved to a place called Bandlaguda, just outside the city. From where there was one bus that would come to the city in the morning and one bus that would go back in the evening. And this essentially meant that most of the women had to stay back at home because they had children. And these women could not come into the city as domestic workers because they couldn't go back. And they couldn't come in time to be available to these people at that time in the morning when they would be possible work as domestic workers. And in the area where they were living, there were no middle class neighborhoods around where they could become domestic workers. So contact social networks were not possible. They had to actually walk almost three and a half kilometers to reach the place from where they could get a little more frequent buses. The houses were badly constructed, half constructed actually because the, the railings were not in place, the contractor was not paid on time so the contractor was moving away, toilets were not fixed properly, flooring was not done and it was terrible conditions in which they had to live. Right? And most of the houses, the three-story houses, there were no toilets. And one of the women talking to me said that we don't drink water during the daytime. And for a moment I thought that she was saying that they don't get drinking water in the morning, so they don't have enough water to drink. And then something hit me that why did she say then so something about daytime and why is she telling me this? So I pushed her. The story is that since there are no toilets in the house, they have to go out into the open. There are hills around. And if those women go out into those hills during the daytime, then there are men hanging around there who could pounce on them and attack them. So the only time when they could actually go for their toilet needs was early in the morning when they were sure that even the worst kind of pouncer would actually be asleep. 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning who would be waiting for a woman to come there and attack them. Therefore they had to stop drinking water during the day because if they drink water during the day then it would build up bladder pressure and then it would become difficult. Right? Now think about this. We wanted to widen the road so that vehicles could pass and the consequence of this is that women had to regulate the circulation of fluids in their bodies. A solution for this could be at so many different levels. It could be at the level of building proper toilets, it could be at the level of saying that let's not widen the roads here in the first place. It could be that if we are relocating people then they have to be given houses here. All of this is a matter of politics, policy, planning, activism, all of that. But ultimately, the fight is between the human body, marked in a particular way, it's a gendered body, not any random body. And it's a fight against the circulation of capital. Because cars had to go through that road to transact certain kinds of businesses which would make certain kinds of capital accumulation possible. So the city is being restructured to facilitate circulation of capital in a particular way, accumulation of capital in particular locations and the right to the city has to be about altering that. So when we are saying that we want to be able to say how this city will be, we want to make the rules, we want to tame that logic of saying that to jana hi hai. vehicles will have to pass through this, there is nothing given about it. We should be able to say that there is nothing given 
nothing so natural, nothing so uncontestable about saying that vehicles have to pass through this. Right? So, that's what the right to the city story originally conceived was. That it is about trying to deal with the imprint of capital on the city because it is the circulation of capital, it is the logic of capital which produces the urban form. So, we have to be very clear about a few things when we talk about right to the city and the commons which is that number one, right to the city is about a moral claim. It's a claim for justice. It's a fight that you cannot get away from. If it is not a fight, it is nothing. It is a fight. Right? There is no way you can say that ki yaar thoda sa de do humko. That is not right to the city. And it is about protecting and expanding spaces of common sharing and collective ownership. What is the moral basis of this? The moral basis of it is that the city itself is the result of the consequence of collective effort over a long period of time, which has been appropriated and taken away by capital. If we can understand that as the broad framework in which we have to think about this, then we can move on to the next section of the workshop. It's not about polit power because I'm saying it is politics. It's political because it is about power. Right? That's number one. Always remember that this is about power. There's no way we can run away from this. Then the question is Are the gated community people realizing their right to the city? If they are, then what do we do about it? Because the others are not able to realize their right to the city. This is the reason why I am saying that this is about a collective right, this is about a universal right and that means then that there is a notion of a good city which is crafted through your thinking. Right? We need to have a notion of what that good city is. Because we are saying that we want our city to be transformed and that it should be something that allows me to transform myself. What is that ideal? Right? Once we have clarity on what that ideal is, then we will realize that right to the city is actually a tool, a crowbar for us to use to challenge the way in which the gated community is operating. They are not exercising their right to the city, they are usurping collective resources. Right? And if it is about power, we have to be absolutely confident in saying that they are usurping resources. If we don't have the confidence to say that, then we are in trouble. And you can say that only, that is the reason why we kept saying that it's about moral. You have to be sure that morally you are right. That confidence comes only from that. Right? Of course, nobody is going to agree with you. Why would a gated community agree with you on your idea of right to the city if you are calling them usurpers? And if they are not going to agree with you, then what is the mechanism through which you are going to make this work? That's the question of institutional design, that's a question of politics, how do we do this? Right? Therefore, this question, ki bhai, aapke, hamare paas institution si nahi hai? We don't have an institution through which we can do this, right? And that's also the question that you are asking in some sense about, so if there is this road, then how do we decide whether the road should go through this or not? 
Is that a question of deliberate, deliberative democracy where five people will sit together across the room and agree with each other, produce a consensus and then build the road? Agar waisa nahi hoga, then what do you do? If five people will say that, no, we don't want anybody to go through this road except ourselves and they have the power and the money to do that, to put barricades and security guards, what do the rest of the people do? That's why I said that this is about a fight. Now, If you have the fight, if you have the moral charge, if you know what is good and right, if you are operating with that conviction, then you have to build your own institutions. If you go to any institution, then you will not be able to do your that institution is designed to take things away from you. What's the point of that? So you have to build your own institutions. Right? That's why I'm saying that the talking about right to the city places a huge onus on you. You have the responsibility to build those institutions that are going to be responsive. Now let's look at what are the institutions available to us in the city. Historically, what was it? You had taxpayers, right? Rate payers association. Hmm. Property tax itna jada le le rahe hain. So we fight against it. So you have those associations. You have property owners associations, cooperative housing societies hain. Sab jaga pe. Those institutions are there. You have the local governance bodies, ward elections and so on. What else did we have? RWS, which is in some sense the rate payers, right? Tax bharte hai, is liye resident welfare association hai. Ko kitna paisa de rahe hai, humko kitna mil raha hai, wapas. Resident welfare associations are fundamentally in nature, they are taxpayers associations, right? Old institutions that seem to be working in whatever way, girte padte, they were doing something, they are not available to you anymore. New institutions have been promised, but they are on paper, they are not available to you. Ward committees, ward sabhas, area sabhas. Hey, nahi. What does that mean? It means that if you take away the institution, then there is no place anywhere for people to speak. And that already means that the forces against which you want to fight have won. Their big victory is in removing the institutions that you need. So what do we do? What kind of institutions do we need to build to make this work? Is ward sabha, is area sabha, is ward committee the appropriate form, will it work or do we need to build other institutions, right? And we don't have to be limited to the statutorily provided institutional forms. They have a certain use, but that's not the only form in which you can do this, right? So let me give you an example of how this is working in some instances. There is an area in Hyderabad called Bholakpur. It's right in the center of the city now, but at one time it used to be outside the city limits, between Secunderabad and Hyderabad, on the east side of this lake which is in the center of the city, Hussain Sagar. Bholakpur started in the mid-19th century as a center for leather tanning, <coughs> because it was outside all city limits, open lands, marshy somewhat. That was where the leather tanneries were set up. Why were leather tanneries set up there? Because the British army and the British industry needed leather, tanned leather. And Hyderabad was a large meat eating region. So there were lots of animal hides that were available in this region. If you transport leather 
untreated, the time it reaches the destination, it is destroyed already. Right? It's like taking banana peels and sending them off over 48 hours of train journey. By the time it reaches there, it's no longer a banana peel. Right? So you need to treat the leather. And that's what Bholakpur was, Bakaram village. And there were partnerships between Tamil Muslims and Hyderabadi Muslims who set up those tanning centers. By 1920s, <coughs> this Bholakpur found itself in the vicinity of new emerging industrial landscape in Hyderabad. DBR mills, Neta spinning mills, a number of spinning mills that were coming on the east side of the tank bun. And then Golconda cigarette, Charminar cigarette, the Nizam state guaranteed railways office, which is where the bus bhavan is located now, Praga machine tools, Deccan engineering, all kinds of manufacturing industry all around it. In the next 40, 50 years, residential areas begin to emerge around it and by 1970s, 1980s, you already have a region that is being hemmed in on all sides by housing and in the middle of it, you have these tanneries and then the economy begins to change. So you have more and better railway networks, better roads, so it's possible now to transport leather much faster from other centers of collection to places where you actually have leather industry. Hyderabad didn't have leather industry. No forward linkages. We just tanned it and exported it. Sometimes directly to Europe, sometimes to leather industry in Chennai. By 1980s, the leather that was coming in started dwindling. By early 90s, in order to remain in competition, the tanneries had to take the use of pretty dangerous chemicals, hexavalent chromium, mercury, all kinds of chemicals, which are dangerous and very toxic. Pollution control board steps in and says shut them down. So tanneries will have to shut down throwing out a large number of people out of work. Roughly the same time when all the other manufacturing industry around also begins to shut down. And in 91, 92, 93, you have the trouble in the Middle East, Iraq occupying Kuwait airport and material that's going from Bholakpur into Europe via Kuwait airport gets stuck there and overnight Businessmen in Bholakpur begin to lose money in demerages. They are stuck. Right? What do they do then? They shut down the tanneries because of the pollution control board orders. They experiment with forward linkages, trying to make belts and bags and so on. But they don't have experience in doing that. They don't do very well. Leather industry structure itself begins to change. At the lower end, you have a large number of men working at very low wages. And at the higher end, you have a small number of women fashion designers who are bringing in all the extra money into it. China enters the market because China can harness, har harvest a lot of pig skin. And China is getting more and more connected to the US and Europe. And they bring in fashion intelligence from all those markets much more aggressively than India can ever do. So even in other places where leather is kind of working, begins to go down. Bholakpur does not have any further forward contract, so it just begins to go down. Right? So you have a, an area which has now become a municipal ward with about 70-80,000 population. People who are trying to figure out how to survive through these changes and they figure that you know the best thing to do is to see what we are really good at which is picking up the dregs of the leftovers of consumption. You eat an animal and you take out the skin 
you buy fruit and you throw away the plastic bag. Bholakpur collects the plastic bags and segregates it, turns it into granules and sends it back into plastic recycling. And once they figure this, they figure that we can do this with a lot of waste in the city. One of the myths about India is that India does not recycle waste. We are often told that we have to recycle, right? Just think about it. How many households throw away their newspaper? You sell it. You sell your plastic from your house. Very large percentage of our waste is actually recycled through these channels. Rag pickers pick it up, somebody else picks it up, but something or the other happens and it goes into recycling. That's what Bhulakpur does. So in 2009, something terrible happened in Bhulakpur. <clears throat> there was a water contamination, drinking water contamination, 10 people died. The contamination was because of E. coli bacteria. Right? E. coli comes from sewage contamination. That's the only source. How did sewage enter the drink, drinking water pipeline? It entered the drinking water pipeline because the drinking water pipeline is going through the underground around which there is sewage. Pipelines are old, joints are rusted and because of the increased population and people not paying attention to the gradient, sometimes it becomes necessary for people to attach small pumps to this to suck water out of it. Small quarter HP pumps. That's how you get the water. And in any case, water supply is not continuous. So there are an hour of water supply and then there is vacuum in the pipeline. What happens then? There is low pressure in the pipeline and there is sewage around it, it sucks it in. Right? And that goes into the houses, 10 people die, 1000 people get hospitalized and the government and the media comes down on this saying that this happened because of illegal tanning. and pollution caused by the plastics recycling and they shut off power supply to the area for 40 days to shut down all the plastics recycling and grinding machines. Right? How did people get around this? They said the government wanted to relocate everything from there. They found a politician a politician's widow who has some influence on the current chief minister because the current chief minister's career was shaped by her husband when he was alive. So the lady contacts the chief minister and says, please do something about this. These people need electricity, restore everything and it is done. What kind of an institution is this? They couldn't have fought, they couldn't have done dharnas, but they managed to get stuff, right? And what is their real power? Because they are all people belonging to a particular community, internal divisions notwithstanding, over the years they have developed the cohesiveness to vote together. They decide who gets elected from that ward. And therefore, they can dictate to the politicians or negotiate with the politicians to some extent. And they have trade associations. It's those trade associations which did this. Right? Ward committees nahi hai. That's not what did this. So what I'm pointing out is that there are a number of institutions which are hidden from our eye 
but they are there, they are capable of influencing, they are capable of arguing and negotiating and getting what they want. So one of the things we need to keep in mind is what kinds of visions do these organizations and institutions work with? Because they don't necessarily work with formal schematic notions of democracy. Right? I would hesitate to say that I am going to ask you know, a 70 year old, old lady whose husband helped someone to get what I believe is my democratic right. Right? I would think that that's just not right. But these people, they know that that's what works and it's fine. And that is the big challenge of realizing right to the city in our cities, that there are all kinds of forms, institutions that actually produce results. And those results are not necessarily visible to us in the form of, if we try to look at it through our schematic understandings of what cities are, right? I mean, everybody, all of us know that a large percentage of even the middle class now is outpriced from the property market in cities. Today, if I want to buy a house for myself, impossible, I can't. If I start today. 5% of the people can afford to own property in the city now unless they actually owned property long before. They inherited property. But today, from your earnings, you can't afford to own property or buy property in the city. It's been like that for a very large number of people for a very long time. <coughs> if you are excluded from formal housing, for formal land ownership, land markets, if you're excluded from formal finance markets, how do you get housing? Slums. Right? You build in violation of the building code. You get permission for one apartment, you build five. That's how you actually make it possible for people to survive. How do you, how did people get land in the past? We have a map, I don't know if we have, if I brought it today. All the Muslim dominated slums in Hyderabad are located south of the Bombay Highway or the west of Bombay Highway. Nothing at all north of it. What explains that spatial pattern? It simply means that when they managed to get lands which were formerly the commons, river banks, foreshores of tanks, hillsides, they took over those places and when they took over those places, it was the politicians who helped them and because they need the votes. We can't get away from this, right? We have to live with this and within this we need to figure out how things work. Because power is not so many discrete entities. It's a continuous medium. It operates through networks, it operates through norms and you need to navigate that. The same Bholakpur, we had another peculiar problem. There's a community toilet which was, which was in need of repair. Community toilets are a very weird technology. They're very, very difficult to maintain because you need to bring water, you need to clean them every day, the tank gets filled up, somebody has to clean it up. Two, three years time, you need to pull it down and rebuild it. Once when it was pulled down, people around the area who owned property said, please don't rebuild this here because that means if you build it, then our rental values will not increase. But there are people who don't have toilets and the people around this who owned property said, that's not our problem. A toilet is a private thing. Somebody should build toilets inside their houses. How can they be in public spaces? For two years, 
the women in that area did not have a toilet. Their houses were too small, the community toilet was gone, the men were going to the mosque where they had toilets, but here nothing. So what did they do? They wrote letters to the Human Rights, State Human Rights Commission. They wrote appeals to the chief minister. They went to the court. And what were the name in which they were asking for these rights? Human rights. Women's rights. Muslims and minorities, so please, at least in that name. Voters. Kisi bhi naam pe aap mang lo, they didn't get it. Because property trumped it. Individual property owners, more powerful than this. Ultimately, at one point of time, we produced a map, we produced a document, we produced pictures, we produced something else, something else, something else. And then, in some meeting, somebody invited the commissioner to the World Toilet Day function. And there, the sad story was told to him. He looked at it and something got into his head and said, why is this not being done? It has to be done. And something gets connected in the middle of it. Till date, we don't know how it happened. But it happened. He said, all right, let's do it. I think at some level, what happened was that there was somebody who was waiting for a contract to build a toilet. And somebody who was waiting for a contract to maintain it. Right? And those connections got made and we got the toilet. We didn't get it in the name of right to the city. We didn't get it in the name of humanity. We didn't get it in the name of women's rights. Nothing. We got, got it through some happenstance. Right? That's the challenge. What do we do when so many different things are happening around us? How do we structure our pol politics and our political imagination? And what is the work that we need to do? And I am suggesting to all of you that you need to be very aware of these histories. Kaun hai, kya hai, kaun se institutions hai. Through what mechanisms are people able to make things happen? And that's why it is important to keep in mind that we can't work with hard and fast rules saying that this is what it is. Iske naam pe hum le to ho jayega. It's not going to work. We need to figure out how to make things work. And that is the particular context in which, which is also the reason why it's important for us to place that right to the city at that highest level. Because it allows us to do all of this. Otherwise, we can very simply say that, look, property owners, property less people, somebody has to lose, you know, we'll figure it out, that's all. It doesn't work like that, no? We are saying somewhere that it's impossible, it's horrible, it's injurious to human dignity if people will have to cook, raise children and be forced to meet all their bodily discharges right there in that same room. That's what the women were doing. And that was the big challenge for us because how do you tell someone that this is the place where I cook food, this is the place where I raise my children, this is the place where I sleep and this is also the place where I collect my own excreta in a cardboard box and take it out and throw it out. So they won't even tell you. So there are injuries and injustices that are hard to put into words. right? And we need to then therefore keep in mind that that at some level this is actually about a sense of dignity, a sense of shame, a sense of injury and not just about economic resources. That's what being human means. Right? And we need to be able to connect our politics to that. And we can do it only if we have that sense of faith also. Right? Karna hi hai, kisi bhi hal mein. Aur kar sakenge. If we don't have that faith, 
अल्टीमेटली वॉट इज इट्स इट्स बेसिकली मैटर ऑफ फेथ ना रैशनली कैसे डिफेंड कर सकता हूँ मैं कि ये हो सकता है इन दिस सिटी एवरीबडी विल हैव क्लीन एयर इज नॉट समथिंग दैट यू कैन रैशनली डिफेंड इन एनी वे यू कैन ओनली से दैट इट्स एन आर्टिकल ऑफ फेथ फॉर मी दैट एवरीबडी मस्ट हैव क्लीन एयर सो कीप इन माइंड दैट एनालिसिस पॉलिसीज रैशनल arguments deliberations sitting across the table all of these are different ways in which we can get to it but the binding glue is being human so for from the point of view of right to the city it actually makes sense to say that we take all of this into account but we understand the urban more as an ideological construct more in terms of cultures more in terms of a frontier than as a statutory or a bounded place which is 35 square kilometers or 40 square kilometers right there is no place that is not touched by capital no place which is not touched by circulation of money so at some level the entire earth is urban to some degree or the other and the degree of intensity is essentially a question of how it is connected to other places right a lot of people when they travel through rural areas say ki are yahan to coca cola mil raha hai ye rural kaise ho sakta hai right yahan pe to sabke gharon mein tv hai और सेंधी के दुकान में जाएंगे तो चाइनीज का खाना मिल रहा है गो टू एनी बार एनी रेस्टोरेंट एनी वे साइड लिकर शॉप यू गेट चिकन 65। फाइव वॉट इज चिकन सिक्सटी फाइव इज इट रूरल और अर्बन वेर डिड इट कम फ्रॉम सो इन अ कॉन्टेक्स्ट इन विच स्पेस इज बींग इंटीग्रेटेड थ्रू ऑल काइंड ऑफ फ्लोज एंड नेटवर्क it makes a lot more sense to say that when we call something rural and when we call something urban it is for a particular limited context in which we are using that word i am not at all suggesting that we should dump the distinction that distinction is useful but the distinction is useful because it serves a specific purpose in a specific context okay that means then that the right to the city is something that can become a mobilizing force anywhere across the world it doesn't have to be one big metropolitan city right so let's look at these images now very quickly this is a map of the world and it's a very very politically inspired map it's a map that divides the world into core <coughs> periphery and semi periphery or semi core what does it mean it simply means that you have the core economy in which the primary secondary tertiary sectors of the economy are very well developed it's an advanced economy right aapko somalia mein kenya mein darbhanga mein मुर्शिदाबाद में जहां पे भी जाओ आपको किसान काम कर रहा है केले बना रहा है शुगर केन बना रहा है वर्क्स एट आवर्स टेन आवर्स अ डे फुल्ली इन्वॉल्व इन द वर्क एंड द अमाउंट ऑफ मनी दैट पर्सन अर्न्स फॉर दैट लेबर इज नॉट इवन अ फ्रैक्शन ऑफ व्हाट समवन अर्न्स सिटिंग इन द कोर इकोनॉमी डूइंग फाइव आवर्स ऑफ वर्क एट अ कंप्यूटर टर्मिनल राइट दैट्स द डिफरेंस so the core economy is what it is because of a number of historical and geographical factors which have given the core economies the advantage they are all national economies where resources are brought from the periphery primary sector mining quarrying agriculture 
and we assume that this is something which is bounded and organized within the national territory. India hai, Bangladesh hai, Pakistan hai. We know that, you know, one of them will go up, come down, whatever. But less developed countries, least developed countries, developed countries, third world countries, fourth world countries, first world countries, second world countries, we're talking about countries as the units. What is this map actually like? It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You know that the boundaries are matching each other very accurately. There will be some gaps. So for example, you have a international boundary that is supposed to be the middle line of a river, like it happens in Sir Creek. Uh, Sir Creek is going this way today and it's going this way tomorrow at the same place. Or if it has a flood, which ex extends the water on one side, where exactly is the international boundary? What if you have an island on it, which on one day is on this side of the middle line of the river and on the other day it is on the other side of the river, as it happens on our eastern border with Bangladesh, the Char lands, right? But those things, if we leave aside, very broadly the world can be divided into pieces that fit with each other. Right? What happens <clears throat> in the late 90s, in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, is that that old order breaks down because that old order was something that was also coincidental with the Cold War. Because the Americans wanted to give us technology or sell steel, the Russians also wanted to sell steel and technology to us. We had to deal with that, right? The world as geopolitical regions was divided up, carved up because of the Cold War in a particular pattern. Poverty becomes a big issue because of that. Because if people are poor, then they will have to figure out whether it, it makes sense for them to go this way or that way. So we need to deal with that. Development becomes a very big issue after the Second World War because of that. What happens in the late 80s and early 90s is that the Cold War comes to an end. The German wall comes down, Soviet Union collapses, and there's a lot of excitement across the world. Now communism is gone. We don't have to think about communism and socialism anymore. We can have democracy across the world. We can have free markets across the world and therefore the world is going to be of a very different sort in which we can say that you have one unified market. So if you have a unified market then it really doesn't matter, right? I mean nation states are then only necessary for making some smaller changes here and there but by and large you don't really have to think about nation states as important actors. This was the sentiment in the early 90s. If that is the case, then we need to think more in terms of connectivities than in terms of boundaries and borders. And what are the places that are connected to each other and how are they connected? One way to think about it is the airports. Because airports connect places. So effectively, I don't know if any of you have read this novel called Shadow Lines. There's this beautiful sequence in Shadow Lines in which an old lady goes to Bangladesh and she actually expects to see a physical border at which there are people with guns on both sides standing to kill each other. And she comes out of the airport and people tell her that, look, I mean, it's in the airport that you actually have the border when you cross the immigration counter. The boundary between Bangladesh and India is in the airport. When I go to the US from here, if you fly one of the Middle Eastern lines, 
then sometimes you can actually finish your customs and finish your customs and immigration in the airport in the Middle East. Beyond that, you are in the plane, you are already in American territory. You are no longer in the Middle East. Right? So, airports is one possibility. And the more powerful city is the one in which there are more passengers passing through. So, Heathrow, JFK, Tokyo. Another way of thinking about it is, <clears throat> let's look at the internet connections or telephone calls. What is the volume of calls between cities? Who is calling whom? At what rate? Places between whom you have a large, large amount of data passing are more important than the others. Right? The problem was that in the early 90s, we didn't have data to actually measure these connectivities and say that this is how cities are. <clears throat> and we didn't know what kind of data to look for because we were still thinking in terms of nation states. Therefore, the economic census is done by the nation state and it collects data for the territory, it doesn't collect the data for connectivities. So what if I say that after globalization, the city which has the highest number of headquarters of multinational companies is the more powerful city. The city with the least number of multinational headquarters is the least powerful. So I move away from the core, periphery, semi-periphery kind of hierarchy and say a city with big connections, city with medium level connections, a city with lower level of connections, a city with the least amount of connections. Right? And I, all I need to do now is to look for data that tells me about these connections. Therefore, I look for multinational companies, I look at flight data, I look at internet traffic, all of those kinds of things. And I can say then that alpha cities, beta cities, gamma cities, and then I may find even more class intervals within that and say alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. This is the hierarchy, this is how the world is organized. So what have we done? We have moved away from a jigsaw puzzle into something that looks like a galaxy of stars which are interconnected. Our new world map is that. But is the world really like that or only like that? You realize by mid 90s that depending on what your passport is, where you can go in the world is determined. Right? If you are Indian, if you are Muslim, as opposed to if you are an Afghan and a Muslim, as opposed to a Bangladeshi, where you can actually go, which immigration controls you can pass through, who gives you visa and who doesn't give you visa, all these things change. That means the nation state has not gone away anywhere. It is still very much there. And so we needed to then think about how else to think about the world. Right? We moved from a jigsaw puzzle to a galaxy and then we have to go back to the jigsaw puzzle because they have go not gone away. Now what we have is a mosaic with stars studded on that and both of them are somehow influencing each other. Just think about it, World Trade Center is attacked, the mayor of New York gets to address the UN, General Assembly. Right? 5,000 people killed in an Indian city, the mayor of the city doesn't get to talk to the UN General Assembly. It just doesn't happen. So, geopolitically, your location and the power that accrues to you because of that location, because of the history of colonization, because of the history of Cold War, because of the history of all kinds of processes, is what actually shapes what your prospects are. 
within this, what begins to change in the mid 90s, and this is where the story of capital really is, is that we began to lose control over our circulations of money. And because we lost control over how to regulate movements of money, and because it has become possible now to create layers upon layers upon layers of financial transactions with something small at the core of it, you have a very peculiar situation where you may be buying a house, you may think that you own the house, but you mortgage it, then you are paying somebody, that fellow goes and sells that mortgage to somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody else, and these things get consolidated in some form. You end up with some pensioner in Singapore having a stake in what happens in houses and housing markets in the west of the US. Which is a very funny thing. After the 2008 meltdown in Singapore, which is a very, very domesticated city, for the first time we saw people, old people, coming to a park and saying this is wrong because they were sold financial instruments in which the small print told them that these are high risk investments and they didn't know it and they lost everything because of something that happened in the US and they were pissed off and they were so pissed off that they actually came out into the public space which is very very you know difficult in a place like Singapore but they came out because they felt really upset so upset that you know anything can happen now and you know, I don't mind going out and speaking <clears throat> so interconnections everywhere and the beauty of many of our Indian cities even now is that with all of those interconnections it is still possible for local places to somehow survive because they're so opaque, nobody knows what to make of them. It's not possible for you to say that, okay, I'm sitting in New York, I'm going to put in $10,000 to buy a piece of land with this survey number in Hyderabad because that piece of land may have all kinds of claims locally. The boundaries of that may look like one thing in one government file and something else in another government file. <coughs> and that's what saves these cities. So in some sense, the, the local mess is what is actually keeping these places from being completely ripped apart. But that also then can, in very complicated ways, make it very difficult for people because within that space, there are people who are trying to make connections. And then you don't have the mechanisms to regulate and fight. That's what is the problem in places like Gurugaon, places like high-tech city around Hyderabad, because tremendous amounts of very, very rapid, intense changes happen. Barely 20 years ago, I used to keep running into people who would tell me that, oh my God, we just saw somebody taking two big gunny bags full of currency notes <clears throat> in a bullock cart saying that he just sold off some land. And they don't even know where to put that money, you know. Because they don't even have a bank account. So they're just taking currency notes in, in, in gunny bags. This is just barely 20 years ago. You have a piece of land in which the title has not been mutated. So some great grandfather of mine owned that and I think I have a stake in it now and then I start building something there and then suddenly somebody shows up and says that but your grandfather, great grandfather actually had two wives, I am the great grandson of that other wife about whom you didn't know and he can actually show me documents to prove this. What do we do? How do you actually move forward? Right. So there is a lot of friction in our cities that makes things sticky, difficult to move, which is also sometimes gives you the opportunities to fight. And this happens locally in many places in very, very interesting ways, right? And we can't cut through this and say that 
we have to plan this and make this city like New York. It doesn't work. It doesn't work even in New York. It doesn't work in Detroit, right? In the Detroit area, we have seen lots of people leaving Detroit, going away. Their lands are there, they're being converted into farms, they're being converted into something else. Nobody knows what's going on. That's what is interesting, depressing, challenging about our cities. Within that context is what we need to look for opportunities to think about these cities. New York, London, N-Y-L-O-N. There are people who actually commute between the two cities. They work, it's a 10-hour flight, right? So you go over the weekend to London and actually work in New York. Or you work in London but live in New York over the weekends. That very tightly integrated London-New York connection. And then you have the homeless person who is rooted to one place, right? It's that being fixed to one place which can be extremely disabling, can be an expression of being disabled, but it could also be that location of resistance. This is what I'm holding on to, because that's the place from where I can actually defend what I have. It could mean many things, right? So it's that spatial imagination of who is able to move, where, what kinds of things are possible that we need to think more and more carefully in our cities. London is supposed to be a very, very affluent city. But it's not uniform across London. There are so many places where child malnutrition and deprivation is so high that it can be very, very depressing. What does this tell us? Part of what this tells us is that this idea that the old core and periphery needs to be revised into thinking that the periphery is right there in the core and the core is right there in the periphery. Lindsay's work partly is about trying to figure out what's happening to commons in Houston Manila and Hyderabad and she is finding that very similar policies of land monetization have taken away common resources from people and we need to figure out how to, to, to reclaim some of those things, right? But that's what is the process that's happening across the world. Who are the most privileged in these cities? There was this scholar called Richard Florida, who did a very interesting experiment. He went around and actually surveyed a large number of people in different cities and came to the conclusion that there is actually now a class of people that can be called the creative class, which has a certain kind of lifestyle and cities which are hospitable to them are seen to be more prosperous cities, right? And if you're a social scientist or an activist, you would immediately say that, is that a causal connection or is that a coincidence or which way does the cause actually work, right? Or it may not even be a causal connection at all. It may be a coincidence and that coincidence needs to be explained. It can be explained in multiple ways. So what is this lifestyle? It's a lifestyle that expresses multiple sexual orientations. It's a lifestyle that demands nightlife. It's a lifestyle that demands a particular kind of entertainment and indulgence from the city. A certain opportunity for consuming life and experiences in a particular way. If we have them, then the city will do well, right? So what does that mean? Should we then try and redesign our cities to facilitate all these? One of the reasons why a number of countries are today willing to reconsider their colonial, archaic rules about 
laws about sexuality is because of this, because they think that it's, it's, it's good economics. They're not doing it because they actually think that human expression of sexuality and desire needs to be nourished and nurtured and supported in multiple forms. They're doing it because they think that, hey, let's have a few more gays in the city, it might, we might actually do better economically. Right? But when we do stuff like that, will that really do the trick for us? Or will we end up in a complete mess? This is a small town in UP. Yeah, and this town called Shikohabad is in the middle of a region that produces potatoes. Large number of potato farmers all around it. And we had an intern who worked with us for some time and he is from Shikohabad and we forced him to sit down and make maps of the town based on what he knew about which caste people lived where, what economic activities took, where, took place where and so on. And he was very, very upset. He said that this is not proper knowledge, you know, I can't validate it, I cannot triangulate it, there is no census data. But I said, but you know that to be to the truth, so why don't you make the map? And then he slowly started making the maps and then the questions began to emerge. This is a highway that cuts through the town, right? And you have people living all over. And SCs, the scheduled caste people, never sell food in the town. The food business in the middle of the town is all done by upper castes. It's a small town, everybody knows who is who. And people don't want to be seen eating food prepared by or sold by the untouchable. So what do they do? They walk all the way to this highway and there are junctions here and that's where they sell food. Because people who are passing through one can claim that we don't know who is selling the food. Two, even if they know, they're more or less confident that nobody is watching them. So for a scheduled caste person to make some money out of making food and selling it, this is where it is possible. He or she is not going to be able to do it inside the town. It's just not possible. What about institutions? We the number, he made a number of maps, right? He made maps of communities, castes, made maps of infrastructure, schools, colleges, who goes where. And then suddenly we realized that <coughs> girls from certain castes do not manage to go all the way to college because the high school which is the intermediate stage is too far from their houses and they cannot walk all the way through. And they can't afford the cost of... Now we can say that, but this is something that we already know because access to schools is very important, but we do that at the level of primary schools mostly. We never do this at the level of the high schools. And if that one middle link is gone, then your opportunities beyond that are gone. Right? We know that those girls don't go to college. We didn't know that this is why it doesn't happen. What's happening to the ecology? You have a river here. This area used to be a big pond. That pond has now completely turned into real estate. First it turned into a garbage dump. And then from a garbage dump, in, it turned into a housing colony. And who are the property owners there? They're all Yadavs. Shikohabad is considered to be a big fortress of Yadav caste power. So they are the ones who own houses there. Which is the place where the possibility of communal flare-up in this town 
Chamukhi Mai Temple at the Chaurasta. That's the place where Trishuls are distributed. And it's strategically located at a place from where trouble can start. But is everybody who is not a Muslim, uh, who is not a Hindu safe here? Or there are no conflicts between them, that's not true. There are older Muslims living in one part of the town, newer Muslims living in another part of the town, and they don't have access to a graveyard. It's a huge trouble. And then, how do you take the body if the Kabrastan is on the other side and you have to go through a colony? Every time you walk through it is a potential riot. Right? So, right to the city then, in a context like this, cannot be understood without an understanding of caste and religion. Your identity matters so much. <clears throat> Distribution of caste and religion. Infrastructure, very clearly, this particular caste, big in investment in infrastructures. Public government infrastructures. <clears throat> You see the pond? Here. They are all gone now. Okay. So, Hyderabad city, we are actually on the eastern side of the city. It is divided by a river which goes somewhere towards the east, south. South of that is the old city, the Musi river. It is a very short river, 169 kilometers, somewhere on the east side, uh, west side of the city and it is a tributary to the Krishna river. So, when the city begins, it begins in the Golconda fort and some of the caravans would come all the way up till here, north of the river and about 425 years ago, the city actually got built around Charminar and this was built by, planned by a Persian scholar. It was an itinerant, he came here <coughs> and he planned it. So, it was an old Shia planning skill and it matters, right, whether it is Shia or a Sunni, <laughs> but he did plan it and the story about Charminar is that he told the workers that I am putting the lime here, let it stay for as long as I am not back. I am going away back to Persia, I am coming back after some time. So, you wait until then, let it cook. <coughs> and he did not come back for a long time and these guys got very impatient and they said let us build it because we do not know whether he is alive or he is dead or whatever. So, they started building and then the man comes back and says what? Well, I told you to wait until I come back. So, you have built it, but it is going to have a flaw. So, we do not know what that flaw will do to Charminar at what point of time. It seems to be remaining until now. Mir Momin is the name and Mir Momin ki daira, his grave is still around in Hyderabad and you can go and see it if you want to at some point. And then, the city begins to grow and you get the British cantonment in the north side. Yeah, Secunderabad. So, you have a city which is fort based, which emerges at the fall of the Delhi Sultanate as part of the rise of the Deccan Sultanate from Golconda with trade connections to Machli Patnam on the east coast. Mangalore on the west coast and further up Bombay via Aurangabad and of course, the administrative connection all the way to Delhi, which is where the Mughal empire was. And then the city begins to grow 
and Miralam tank gets constructed after Tipu Sultan's defeat because there was a prime minister who felt that something should be done in his name and he built and it's a very beautiful tank. So, the city begins to grow north and begins to come down from the south and this is actually a bit of an error in this because in the previous maps you didn't see beyond this. These two tanks were constructed in the aftermath of the 1908 great flood in Hyderabad. In all cities you have these big disasters which actually create windows for reconstruction. So in 1908 we had a cloud burst and the tamarind tree which saved a lot of lives in the middle of that flood is still there in the Musi river. If you want to go and see it and pay your respect to it, you can. It's right opposite the Usmania General Hospital. But after that, they built these two reservoirs on the river as flood containing systems. Basically all the excess water would get stored there and then supplied to the city as drinking water. But Hyderabad city is in the Deccan plateau where most of the water bodies are actually artificial. They are constructed by human beings and it is a technology that has come into being in the last five, six hundred years. Right? Indian irrigation system, the oldest known structure is the, ninth, the, the 11th century Kaveri Dam which is the place from where the British learned how to build earthen dams in India. They built one, the French people knew how to build dams, the British didn't know. They built one in Sheffield and it got washed away. So then, so then one of their engineers comes to India and the Kaveri dam required repair work. So while repairing it, he figured out what the technology was and then he became the, the, the source of much of the irrigation dam building. And Sometime in the 14th, 15th centuries is when all of these water bodies were created. This is a stream path map of Hyderabad. So you literally see water flowing and all those water bodies are very, very important for the city. What does that mean? It means that you have a water body here. It has a bund. In the command area, you have agriculture. In the foreshore, you have land that gets exposed seasonally and then gets inundated Then you have rains. When the water recedes, you use it for taking out clay, the fish lay their eggs closer to the foreshore, you have the dhobis taking the brushwood, you have uh, dhobis washing clothes there in, at that end. You have people being given seasonal leases of land in the foreshore for cultivation. In the summer, you grow watermelon there. Who gets the rights to do it? It's the poorest. Right? That's commons management. What happens is when you stop agriculture here and turn it into real estate, then you don't need this water anymore for agriculture. And then all those houses will need to release their sewage somewhere, so they release it into that same nala. So it becomes impossible for anybody to do anything else there. So gradually over a period of time, the commons are lost. And we don't know what to do with them, except suddenly waking up one day and say that, look, we probably need some place where diabetics can take walks in the morning. So we need to fence the lake and create a promenade around it and we need to put machines to clean the water. Essentially this is legacy infrastructure for, from an earlier economy that we are not able to figure out what to do with now and because the property logic is so dominant, we are trying to do something with it. So what would re something like this mean? How do you create stakes for people in resources like this so that they can actually be made to work, right? That's the challenge of thinking about cities. 
This I actually have it in a GIF form and I'll send it to you people at some point. This is Lingampalli, the fag end of the Cyberabad area. You will see a railway line here. And here you will see the imprint of the public sector investment of the 60s, 70s, 80s, big township. And this is a village which had very active agriculture until almost 20 years ago. This is a rocky patch. This is agricultural land. This is the Abadi area where people actually have houses. What happens when the Cyberabad area comes up? <coughs> Lingampalli becomes the last station for the MMTS train. High tech city area, when it was being built, the builder said that this is an area for investment, not for rental property. So there were not many places where people could actually go and live on rent. So people <coughs> continue to live on the east side of the city and commute to the west side through door-to-door -door cab pickups and drop-offs. Right? And one of the things that happened was this connectivity through rail, which eased some of the traffic problem. As this was beginning to happen, this road <coughs> begins to grow a very heavy commercial frontage because there are now people who are willing to buy things, who have the money to buy, the new kinds of migration that comes in. This rocky patch, which is the commons, gets taken over by a couple of non-profits, trusts actually, who run a school here, something else there, something else there. But part of it, of course, also enters the real estate market. That's what happens here. What happens to the agricultural land? This agricultural land turns into apartments because this is property that could be sold. It's just a matter of converting the use. Land use is converted from agriculture to real estate and you have apartments here. And this is a stream that connects two water bodies. There's one up there, Aminpur Lake, and one here, Gopicharu. <clears throat> These two lakes are connected. And what do you think happens? It gets covered because it is unseemly. And it begins to receive all the sewage. So this is no longer visible. Where it is visible, it's a very unseemly sight. And people don't want to look at it if possible. So that's gone. And this transformation is a story of less than 20 years. So that point about communities, use practices, rules, regulations that people can make for their own good is not possible in a context like this because you don't have a sense of community. The community that existed earlier is gone, right? Because communities are actually created through practices, community practices. And with the breakdown of the community practices, your breakdown of the community and therefore breakdown of the commons. One of the biggest criticisms I keep hearing about right to the city is that nobody in India actually claims the right to the city. Of course not. I mean, why would I want to say that I am fighting for right to the city? But that doesn't mean that people are not making claims. They're making claims. They may not even be making those claims through the law. The law is often what? At the end of the day, the law is at best only a crystallization of something that you won in the past which allows you to do something further. That's all it is. If you are not careful, the same thing can be used to beat us with. So that's it.